A lot of times we look at it like a bridge. Uh, on one side of the bridge, they get the theory. On the other side, they get the hands-on application. Uh, you've got to have both of them to come together to make it across that bridge. And in, in the workforce now, and, and people on my advisory committee are saying, we need somebody that not only knows the math, but can apply the math. So it's, it's one thing knowing the formulas of it and being able to do it on paper, but it's something else when you carry it out to the shop and do it. And so task, we take out the rope uh, where I have two students that kind of hold it. And uh, then I pick one student or one student volunteers to be what I call the focus. And so I place them, uh, you know, a couple feet away from the, maybe six feet away from the rope. and just kind of find a big open area. And then I ask all the students, um, why don't you guys find a place to stand where you are, you feel like you are the same distance to this focal person as you are to the rope, which we treat as our line. Right, so yeah, we'll measure you real quick here. That looks about right, okay. Yeah. Right, it looks like you're a little closer to mine than you are the rope, so y'all may need to move a little bit more. Okay. Let's check you real quick, Masumi. So we got this distance, can you duck for me? Thank you, thank you. All right, so you're gonna need to move a little, just a little bit tad farther out, which probably means that you guys will have to move a little bit too, okay. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we've kind of positioned ourselves about equal to the rope and to mod. What kind of shape do you see here? Parabola. parabola. Yeah, it looks like a U-type shape. It is actually called a parabola, and it's the set of points that are equidistant between a focus, which is a single point, and a directrix, which is a line. This is called a directrix because it's going to help us determine the direction of the parabola in a moment. Okay? So imagine what would happen if I moved Mon around. For example, if I move Mon left and right, what are you guys going to have to do to adjust? Yeah, we'll we'll to right. Right. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So we'll move you this direction, everybody adjust. All right, pause once you get to your spot. Are you about the same distance away from Mon as you are from the rope? Yeah. All right, now let's think about what happens if we move outward. So let's move Mon this way. All right, so everybody's moving to adjust. All right, what do you notice? Are you now equidistant? I ask them, what's going to happen when I move the student that I have as my focal point? So um, when I move that student left and right, what's going to happen? So I try to get them, get them to predict for me what's going to happen. So they usually say, oh, we'll just move left and right. And so I kind of confirm that by moving the person, and they all just take a step. I may go left and right. I may just go in one direction. So how do we adjust? So all right, you need to get wider so you're farther away from Mon because you moved away from the line. Okay, so you can see that. Now, can you imagine what would happen if I move Mon forward? Yeah, it'll be almost like a little taco. You know, you have to fold in. So let's move Mon in real close. Wouldn't that mean I'm like the tomato in the middle? So you need to adjust yourselves, okay? Now, I see that you guys are branching outward. Will there ever be a point right here behind him? Why not? He'll automatically be closer along this line to him than it would be the directions, just like you said. So it will always come out, it won't curve back around. Because now and then I've heard people say this is a circle, but it can't be because of that reason, right? So the parabola or U shape that y'all came up with seems to be working so far. Now let me ask you what would happen if I uh, move the rope around a little bit. Let's say we move uh, Dylan, you know, that direction. So Dylan, why don't you take a couple steps that way? What would happen to you guys? We would adjust. I want you to kind of adjust that for us then, okay? All right, so what happened to our shape? It, it I heard angled, shifted. Um, you can tell that the line determines the direction the parabola is now going, although notice that some of you are now behind Mon, so you guys may need to widen out. All right, so there you go. So notice that the direction has changed based on the directrix, so notice how those are tied together. What would happen, do you think, if I moved the rope to the other side of Mon? Flip to the other side, why would we do that? Yeah, so you have to be you have to be equidistant between Mon and the directrix, as you said, so that means you'd have to be on the same side with Mon. So if he flips the, to the other side, so will you. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Do we have any questions? Right? This focal point has a reason why it's called a focus. This is where we're gonna be focusing all our energy when we build our shape. And I said we're gonna be building hot dog cookers later. That's where we're gonna be putting our hot dog. And the directrix helps make sure that everything is in line the way that it should be. Okay? And then this point down here is the bottom of the parabola. Does anyone know what that's called? 
right? It's a vertex, okay? So this is the vertex. It's going to be along the shortest distance between the focus and the directrix. So this would be the easiest place to stand if you want to pick somewhere to stand that was equidistant because you'd just be right directly in between those. I talk about how we use it for solar energy, and they can see that in the paraboloid here. But we, they, it's used to reflect sound like in speakers or to collect sound like they see at football games. They see people holding domes. Um, it's used for satellite dishes to collect radio waves. Um, it's used when people have you know, cameras on you and they had a bright flash of light in the umbrella. What's going on there? Well, the light would go anywhere. They can't control it. But if they put a parabola there, it will then reflect all the light in one direction. So you gain control over these things that typically are difficult to control. And so you know, you're looking at sound. You're looking at light. You're looking at, you know, like with a flashlight, you're looking at heat. You're looking at radio waves. There's a lot of applications. Paraboloid, it's a three-dimensional shape that uh, is a parabola, but kind of rotated, okay? And we talked about the location of the uh, focus, which is gonna be taking the sunlight, bouncing it off every part of the surface and focusing on that one point, which is why we call it the focus. That's used a lot for light energy and so forth, so that we can focus all that heat at that one location and build from that. Now, the directrix is important because we also have to make sure we're focusing or directing to directly toward the sun. So I'm using this little dial here to help direct that in. You can see that it's almost exactly where it needs to be, but I look for a shadow to determine whether it's facing directly toward the sun or not. All right, so what we're gonna do in a second here, is we're almost exactly dialed in. You see that shadow disappearing just a little bit. So it's almost gone. What I'm going to try to do is allow you guys to come up here and you're going to put your hand about where that focus is and kind of feel that heat so you can tell that it's actually focusing in there. Anybody want to see what it feels like? You kind of feel the heat guy in there. You can also see the light on your hand when you do it. It's almost like a light bulb is right there. Now remember the focus we talked about was going to be about two feet out. So you want to focus on that location as opposed to in here. You can tell the difference, the heat. Does anyone else want to touch it, feel it? Why don't you come on up? Yeah, yeah. I should feel the heat with it too. And you'll notice that if you touch the surface here, it's not hot at all, but it's the one point exactly where everything has been sent to, okay? If we had mirrors on this thing, you can imagine how much energy would go there. I've seen it actually cut through metal uh, when you put mirrors on there because then all the light is directed. Now one of the things that we'll do here, if, if it uh, happens quick enough, um, is that we'll try to get this broom smoking. As you can see, it used to be a regular broom, now it's blackened from being uh, put in front of this thing. And that's mainly because the broom is really dry, so that's the reason why it starts steaming pretty quick and smoking. You can almost smell it. Can anyone smell the... Uh, you can smell it. So sometimes it takes a second to kind of heat up. But before long, we should see a little bit. I see a little wisp going here. You see it a little bit? Yeah, a little bit of smoke coming off of it. Yeah, it's burning. See how quickly that happened? And it's pretty cold out here. It's what, 50, 60 degrees? So it's amazing how hot that gets at that location. So do we have any questions about uh, the shape or what's going on here? You see the wind cools it off pretty quick though too. Now you see the, the main thing behind this right now is you have to have the sun to make it really useful, but you can use other shapes. You can bounce sound off of this toward a microphone where it can be recorded and you can hear long uh, distant sounds. One of the things that we've done is we've taken this outside and we have people stand 300 feet away and you talk into it and it launches the sound almost like a perfect beam out toward uh, wherever you want the sound to go. That happens kind of like a little bit like in a speaker system, for example. You can imagine too, when you, you guys are, are watching TV or whatever and you have your satellite dishes, they have a portion of the curve and they're launching that signal to that little arm that's sitting right at where the focus is. So there's a lot of different ways in which this is used to do what it is. It is amazing how many of my students that don't normally engage we become engaged as soon as we do that activity, and then when we go back, they now have some idea of what to do and how to get started. So like when they look at the vertex and the directrix, they have some idea of where it should go because they did it physically. All right, so remember when we were outside earlier, we had the rope. 
So this directrix that we had named uh, represents the rope and the two people holding it. And then we had Mon at the focus. And then all of you had to stand somewhere that was the same distance from this line as you were to the focus. Remember, to determine that distance, uh, we measured directly perpendicular to the directrix. So what I'm going to do is kind of pick a point, because a lot of you measured to different places on the directrix. So I'm going to take a point on this line, and I'm going to draw a perpendicular as if we were measuring from that location. So what I'm going to do is construct a perpendicular line. Okay, And uh, you can see this is kind of like the measuring tape we were using. And then we have to find a place to stand, like you guys did, that's the same distance from the line as it is from the focus. So to do that, we're going to use a little bit of geometry. Okay, uh, What we're going to do is find a segment here between these two points. And we're going to find the midpoint. And any line along the perpendicular that goes through this midpoint, which we call the perpendicular bisector, will be points that are equidistant between these two locations. So what we're going to need to do is construct that. Now what we have is an intersection of two lines. We have a line that we know this point is equidistant between these two points, and we know that we're measuring perpendicular to the directrix. So wherever this point is, is a place that you could stand in relation to Mon and the rope. So what I'm going to do here is trace this point so that you can see what happens if you were to stand in a whole bunch of different locations. So here we go. We're going to move this, and you can kind of see the dots. The dots represent different places that you might have stood. So you can kind of see we get that parabolic looking shape. Now we can see the parabola and we can move it around as we move things around. All right, so remember one of the things we did, once we found our shape here and kind of discussed what kind of shape it looked like and so forth, one of the first things we did is we moved Mon around and you kind of adjusted to it. So when you guys moved left and right, well, when Mon moved left and right, you guys just took steps left and right and you can see that it just shifts that way easily. But then uh, when we moved Mon away, a lot of you naturally wanted to move away with Mon. But then, uh, I think as Cody pointed out, and a couple of you, may, uh, maybe Caleb or Chris, that if we all move toward the focus away from the directrix, then we're too close to the focus. So then you guys said we had to spread out. And so you can see, as this focus moves away, the parabola tends to kind of widen, right? And then we did the opposite when we moved Mon in really close. Then we were too close to the line, so then we had to move closer to the focus also and adjust. So you can kind of see how that comes in. Almost looks like a, a little comet, almost. So you've got this uh, parabolic shape as it moves around. Now one of the other things that we looked at was what happens when you move the rope. So we can do that. So you can see that it angles the parabola. So that's why we call it directrix. It determines the direction of the parabola. At some point, I moved one of the rope holders, and we kind of angled ourselves. Do you remember what happened when uh, we did that? What happened to the shape? It moved, it moved with it. What do you mean? Right. So you're turning your hand, which makes you feel like you're angling it. And so that kind of, that's kind of the idea, but uh, so let's see it. So when I move one of you, or maybe both of you, you can kind of see it a little bit better. The directrix helps determine the direction of your parabola, which is why we call it that. Okay. So what we're going to do in a minute is I'm going to give you an assignment here where you have one of those three but you're missing, uh, so you have two of those three, but you're missing one of them. And so what I want you to do is I want you to draw the one that's missing, and then I want you to sketch the shape of the parabola. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I want you to kind of look at how they're related to each other and adjust them. Following that, I give them a task where they have the vertex and the directrix, and they have to find the focus, or the focus and the directrix, and they have to find the vertex, and they kind of sketch the parabola. Kind of feel out, I try to get a feel then what they really understand about how those are in relation to each other. And then we put a Cartesian plane down on, uh, in another task where they have the same information but they now actually have points and equations and they fill out the, those pieces of information. And so from there we can build in actual distance and measure things out from there. Are you concerned about a particular point? Are you concerned about a particular point? So, so what is it that you're not sure about? I mean, would it just be whenever you're, it's like the derivative, mm -hmm. they're the directives yeah. and the uh, focus, you just put the vertex, right? Yeah, you and know. one of the things you have to do too is focus on the objects and not so much the labels. Mm -hmm. Because you can see here, you put it between the F and the D, but it's actually uh, supposed to be between the right. objects. Is that one not? What? Did I do that one not? Why are you concerned about that one? Because the focus is all over here. 
Okay, what do you mean by all the way over there? Um. Well. So here's a, here's a good question then. Do you feel that that vertex is the same distance to the line as it is from the focus? Uh, yeah. So if you measured from this point to the line. Well, it could come over a little more, but. All right. Yeah, it might want, uh, that's, I think that's part of the point. It could come over just a little bit more. The, the main issue, I think, is that you put the V in between F and D, but those are just labels. So you want to focus on it on the shortest segment. To the directrix. Right? So my main point is I need to have it like the same distance with, from the line to the focus. Mm -hmm. right? The line, and, yeah, to the line and to the focus. So you want to make sure that that, it, the, especially the vertex, is going to be the shortest distance. So you want to kind of, it might help to draw that shortest distance and then place the vertex on it. Okay. While they're working on tasks, I will sometimes, uh, you know, kind of look at individual students and what they're doing. Um, I have uh, just kind of just glance around without it being too intense, kind of just pick up w what common mistakes are being made. But I also have them go to the board. And so like, you know, when we're, we did the vertex and the directrix and they're drawing the shape, there are common mistakes that are, t that are made. And so sometimes students will go up there and they'll do that and then we have to adjust and the students talk about what the issues are and so forth. And so I kind of can assess somewhat from that. All right, so let's, uh, I see most of you have drawn most of your pictures there and have some idea of where they're located. Can we get some of you to come to the board and draw your missing pieces? This is a good one here. This is one that I see a lot of interesting drawings. You want to do it? Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit off, that's all right. The board doesn't fully draw it exactly where you want it. Right, can you label the vertex for us? OK. All right, thank you. Now, I do want to ask you a question, though. Um, How did you know to put the vertex here instead of over here? The way it's angled. What do you mean? <laughs> I noticed on a couple of people's paper that the vertex ended up getting located right here. Can anyone tell me why they think that might be? So in some cases, I saw it right here. Because we were focused more on the letter than the actual object. Okay, so you're focused on that D and the F and want to put it in between those. All right, and you'll notice though if we measure it, if we measure perpendicular to the line, are those going to be equidistant? No. Right, so those are not two equal distances. But if we use the vertex that Amber put up, we get, it's a little bit closer, a little bit off because of the board, but you can see that you'll get a little bit closer distances that way. So now that we've drawn a couple of these, now we didn't put all these up here, but you on your papers have a lot of them already drawn. So what I want to do now is put it on a coordinate system here with a Cartesian plane. We have the x-axis and the y-axis, and we actually have locations for the points and the lines. That way we can start to bring a little bit of algebra in and so we can control these shapes and actually use them to do things. Okay. So um, you'll notice the first thing in part A on your paper there has the directrix at y equals negative 3. How do I draw a line that is y equals negative 3? Draw it across the negative 3 line. All right. Now notice there's two negative 3's on here. How do For the y-axis. For the y-axis? OK. It horizontal. All right. So the line goes horizontal through the y-axis. OK. So we'll do that, All right? You see, w one of the reasons is you have y equals negative 3, so it should go through the y-axis at negative 3, like you said. Um, another way to think of it, too, is that every coordinate on this line has a y uh, coordinate of negative 3, whereas the x can be whatever it wants to be. Now, the vertex is located at 5, 1, so we'll go along 5 along the x and 1 along the y. So there's our vertex and our directrix. What's missing? Focus. focus. Right, how do we determine where the focus goes? You take the vertex and you count up the spots from the vertex to the directrix, or you can count down depending on where the directrix is. And then you take from the vertex, you go back to the vertex, and you count back up that same number of spots, and that's where your focus will be. Can anyone tell me about right five five? Do we agree with that? Yeah. Okay. 
So we'll go ahead and put our point five five down here. And then uh, if we sketch the parabola, um, we don't know exactly how wide it's going to look just yet, but we just kind of get a general U shape there. Okay. They go from station to station and they look for patterns. So I only change like one thing at a time, kind of like they do in science when they try to figure out you know, how a variable interacts with other variables. We just change one thing at a time. So I move them up and down, they see what happens to the equation. They move left and right and see what happens to the equation. All right, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to have you guys move to the stations. I want you to kind of spread out where your groups are, and then I want you to answer the questions in your little uh, question guide there and look at the shape, look at the focus, the vertex position, look at the equation, and think about how those things relate while you're answering those questions. Because we're going to come together and we're going to come up with a formula that will help us to control uh, the parabolic shape to do what we want it to do. Okay, so let's go ahead and move there, and then you can start answering questions, okay? So what are you noticing is happening here? It gets narrower. A what? It gets narrower. It gets narrower? What gets narrower? Uh, the vertex. The vertex gets narrower? Mm -hmm. no. The vertex no. is just a dot, right? So what is it that's really the getting narrower? Parabola. The parabola is getting narrower. Now how is that related to the equation? Do you see any change in the equation? Uh, it goes by fours. Oh, it seems to go up by fours. That's interesting. Something you might want to comment on your paper. Okay. Do they get bigger or smaller as the, as those fours are on the bottom of that fraction, are they getting bigger or smaller as, bigger. as they get farther apart? Oh, which one does it get smaller? Does it go this way? Yeah, we can think of it this way if you want. Yeah, it gets bigger. So what gets bigger? It would actually be, and then wide. Oh, so they get wider and then the number on the bottom gets bigger? So what are y'all working with here? What's going on with your shapes? Um, so the shift across the x axis, like the focus does. Okay, so they're moving along the x axis. Okay. So how is that affecting the equation? It's well over here. It's negative. It's moving in the negative direction, and these are positive. Okay. So you're saying the movement is positive? When it goes this way, it looks like this is a negative. Uh, so which way? Are you saying to the right? Yeah, to the right it's negative, and to the left it goes positive. Yeah, like right here. All right, so when it moves to the right, you get a negative. X minus five. Okay, and that's inside the parentheses there. Yeah. And then when it moves to the left, you get a positive value added onto the X. Yeah. Okay. Since it's, uh, some of my activities involve a lot of kinesthetic things. Any student, no matter what your level, can jump in and kind of move things around and have the manipulations and stuff and measure things. So one of the most important things I, I would say to any teacher wishing to replicate what Dr. Swanigan has done is to make sure the students understand why they're doing what they're doing. Get their involvement, get their buy-in, and just realize that the students generally, many of them will not accept doing for the sake of doing, but they will do for the sake of understanding why they're doing, and they'll just do a better job. Oh,